Right. So welcome everyone for CU Race, our center of excellence. Um, today we have our training on quantum support vector machines and algorithms around it. And this quantum computing is really a hype topic where we have lots of different activities in the EuroHPC joint undertaking. Um, this is a promising technology where we have seen now many activities in different areas of quantum computing. And we will shed light on this a little bit. So what's the difference between adiabatic um, and different other forms like quantum annealing and so forth. On the one hand, basically, but also we have seen that there are different, let's say, real applications already of these. And also this is the idea of the training today is that we have a concrete, let's say, machine learning algorithm that you know perhaps um, from the past, like support vector machines, very sweet material, less parameters than deep learning networks, a very robust algorithm, so to speak. And to have this basically ported to quantum computing represents, of course, a very interesting approach. And we see today that this is not really something where people talk about quantum computing will happening in 10, 10 years and et cetera, et cetera. So rather this is happening today. Of course, we will also see some challenges with this, which here and there maybe allude to a little bit of the big data problem on these devices today. But the modus operandi today would be um, basically in this four parts. I will just show very roughly really the relevance of quantum computing in CU arrays, connecting it a little bit with the, let's say the interesting IPUs we had the last time with the graph networks and the graph chips um, that we have also um, possibly in the next future as another form of hardware, right? Um, and here we start then basically with the first part of quantum support vector machines, which is really more an introduction to the topic. So quantum computing is not at all as simple as we know with zero and ones. Here we talk about, um, you know, different entanglements and different elements, which are basic terminologies, which we know about quantum annealing. Um, why is a qubit different than the zero and ones we know from numeral, numeral bits? and things, um, this is a, let's say, an idea called superposition and things like that. So this will be presented by Ahmed Elibazic, who is here on the call together with Eduardo Passetto, and I will talk about this, uh, about them a little bit uh, later. In part two, then we come to the real essence of the um, quantum support vector machines, which we call SVMs for shorts, and here in quantum space, QSVMs for shorts. We can use them for different areas in science and engineering. Here are some of them like regression and classification techniques that we will then also present. At the end of the seminar, everybody has a basically possibility to have questions and answers solved. And of course, also Amir and Eduardo will be further on also after the seminar available for more questions um, directly. So let me introduce the speakers a little bit. So Amir um, is a you know, very active um, student in quantum machine learning, has already papers there, a PhD student at the University of Iceland, but also basically at the Forschungszentrum Mülich, a researcher. And Eduardo Passetto is basically also a quantum machine learning specialist. Um, I should maybe say that both of them focus a little bit on quantum annealing. Um, basically also derived by the fact that we have Crystal Michelsen in Forschungszentrum Mülich and both Eduardo and Amer working closely with her. And uh, Eduardo is not at the University of Eisen, but at the University of Aachen at the RW2H. Um, shortly for me, I'm teaching high performance computing and parallel scale machine learning here at the University of Iceland. Um, I'm also 18 years at the Mülich Supercomputing Center in Germany and the research group leader there. And uh, maybe relevant also here for these Euro HPC activities, particularly in the quantum area also, is that I'm also governing board member of Iceland. And as I can say, as a member and representative of the Euro HPC governing board member, uh, we really plan a lot in quantum computing. I had a recent talk where I presented a little bit what we plan in the Euro HPC joint undertaking, mentioning that our first, let's say, regulation was mentioning just quantum computing under the horizon 2020 um, framework program of the commission just once. It was basically just a side remark. And now in the new um, Horizon, twin, uh, Horizon Europe and Digital Europe frameworks programs of the commission and the EuroHPC JU, 
we really talk about quantum computing in any sorts of form. So hardware infrastructure, application enabling competencies, this is all um, one area where Europe thinks we can perhaps make a difference. So um, <clears throat> just for the organization of the seminar here, it's basically co-organized with the National Competence Center for Icelandic HPC here in Iceland with the um, EuroCC project, uh, which gives me the opportunity to just point out that the University of Iceland has quite some international students, um, you know, foreign and Erasmus students, a lot, lots of English courses. We do a lot also in high performance computing and data sciences with new professors in the data science area. And also it was particular machine learning slash high performance computing and quantum computing um, focus as well. You see here a little bit the Icelandic HPC, um, you know, um, simulation and data labs where we basically uh, combine our exp expertise in different areas of sciences like remote sensing, which we hear today a little bit, I guess, for some application examples, but also in different areas like natural language processing, which is also huge overlaps with AI and so on, things like we do in COE race. So, and finally, just for the strategic corporations, um, we should point out that we strive together with several key players in Europe uh, as Iceland here uh, with the LUMI towards a modular supercomputing architecture and also within Jülich, where we basically part of the LUMI supercomputer in Finland right now, which follows a modular approach, uh, basically that you see a little bit represented in this different parts, where we believe that the computing that you see today, like a quantum module, it's not at all general purpose, basically in the future. We rather think it will be a combination of different modules for computing, like a cluster with high single thread performance CPUs, a booster with many, many, many core uh, GPUs, um, or basically also other vendors of accelerators, of course, as we will see coming now significantly from AMD and Intel, a data analytics with lots of memory, um, basically also accelerators, but may perhaps more focus really on these spark and data analytics elements and one key theme of today in the seminar will be then how could new modules be basically joining this for some certain elements in a deep learning workflow so which could be the quantum module here um, that we will shed light on today but of course in the future also neuromorphic devices if you want to know more about the strive for exascale um, we basically see here Jülich is of course one of our key partners here the center, uh, Uli Super Computing Center in Germany. There's a nice video explaining a little bit more on this modular concept and also how quantum comes into that. Right, so, so much for the welcome and the introduction of the speakers. Let me just highlight now a little bit more um, why it, this is all relevant for a race. So the relevance of quantum computing um, is, of course, not only represented by the fact that we will have in future a wide variety, perhaps, of quantum devices where we have different hardware infrastructure available for science and engineering. It has also many different benefits and, it, of course, in many different areas. Um, I will allude to some of them here, but, of course, I cannot give a complete quantum computing um, let's say context here. So I pick some examples where we have some concrete publications and also pointers for more reading material. I would like to point you in general to the relevance in HPC and uh, you know projects and center of excellence is like race to an event we had recently in the EuroCC Castiel uh, National Competence Centers environment where we really had a training on quantum computing a whole day where we presented and also here the speakers that we have today presented um, their approaches together with many others in Europe that basically shed light then on quantum computing as a whole much better than we just can provide today in this, um, let's say, seminar uh, in the training that we have for CEO race today. So with this, just for your information, um, for those that come from YouTube, for instance, CEO race has this particular website um, where you find all the information about our specific, um, basically, use cases, our research we do, our approaches and events. So if you want to have more information about CEO race, please go to this website. If you want to have the overall approach, um, you can see that the COE race is obviously um, a little bit focused on engineering, as the wording suggests, AI for simulation-based engineering. 
So then you would say you have the simulation and the experiments based on known, you know, physical laws and numerical methods usually, and they provide data. And this basically with CFD simulations we see here as an example could be really alluding to big data sets, which of course are brilliant input to AI technologies, um, which we basically see with full blown CFD simulations can easily fill extra scale, especially if you want to learn from these data at scale and then combine it perhaps also with hyperparameter optimization, a topic we had in previous seminars, where you try to learn the AI parameters on the fly, things like Raytune, Optuna, and so on, where you basically then really require lots of computing resources. Then there are different approaches how you can use that, um, basically for training surrogate modeling, basically to in basically, yeah, um, kind of accelerate or really try to replace some of the very costly simulations based on the physical phenomena rather on a trained AI model. And this round here is of course a matter of research right now. So how we do this best, um, what models really fit there, what AI algorithms concretely really help. And that's why also today the support vector machines are very interesting material because they are also um, basically known to be used in many areas of sciences and as I said earlier, also very robust technology. So for to erase just as a view, we basically have compute driven use cases here um, that you see in different areas of physics mostly. And then we have also data driven use cases which focus a little bit more on data generation and you know data from satellites or seismic imaging, manufacturing, et cetera. And here the idea is really using these different use cases um, to, to really do AI and modeling intertwined with simulations or with the big data sets we have. And this again is now the point where quantum computing comes in. So each of these different use cases, and you find more information about these use cases on our website, but most of them of course have some form of a data set they basically have. Either they basically produce it with CFD generations as you see here for turbulent flow, for instance, and then have some AI model that they basically use to work with this. And in all of these cases, you will see these two um, in one form or another through all the different use cases. And now that's where quantum computer, uh, quantum computing generally could fit in a little bit, where I give you here an example perhaps in quantum computing, how you can actually use it in optimization. Most of these AI algorithm are basically based on some form of optimization to reduce an error in learning. So you go down essentially a slope here. Um, some people of you know this, it's a stochastic gradient descent here for an example and different optimizers that basically not only are SGD, it could be Adam and others, but the point is really, as you see here, you have an error surface of some, let's say error function that you want to minimize. And with this, you know, you have to find the way downhill where the smallest error is with this hopefully predicting um, as best as possible or reducing the error as best as possible. Now what quantum computing can bring there, for instance, is a different view in this. While we have done this in the past, um, stepwise, as you see here with these different crosses, you would have a certain step learning rate that you go downhill as we suggest this basically, um, step by step iteratively with an optimizer. Um, qubits and the idea of using now quantum computing has options of really obtaining the, the scene as a whole and you kind of literally, as I put here on the right hand side, put water on the scene, right? Which is one of the ideas um, how you can basically translate that to, to normal human beings here listening. Of. So basically you um, essentially put water over it and by this the water automatically will find, you know, the lowest parts. Um, and of course here, several, many of them maybe, as you will see here, it's not at all guaranteed that this was maybe the best one. It could be also here, you see here is also the Aaron, but our path was just going this way. Uh, so chances are that here could be also, let's say another minima or so. So in this sense, you find different minimas and uh, therefore have another approach of finding those with quantum computing. And if this is a, a general theme in all the AI algorithm or almost all algorithms you find, right? There basically lies the potential as an amplification factor, so to speak, for all the different use cases to accelerate the optimization process. And with this, of course, significantly the learning that is happening by using AI algorithms with quantum computing. This is of course, just one example. 
And of course, we will hear later some concrete algorithm with support vector machines, um, which then show you a little bit how that works in practice with some applications. Just a little bit more for the goal of the race and how we want to make quantum computing and other approaches to AI possible. Um, I show you a little bit here what we do in this so-called HPC cross methods work package. We have not only the use cases, we also try to bring the community lessons learned by really intertwining simulation sciences with AI and data-driven sciences with AI and have also its so best practices with scaling machine learning and deep learning codes with Horowat, DeepSpeed or others. Um, PyTorch, of course, we see integrated um, scaling as well. We have different AI methods. We had several um, seminars or trainings already on different of these um, AI modeling techniques. The last one was on graph neural networks as an example. There are data augmentation approaches. We benchmark heavily the HPC machines and also try to understand where Horowat in terms of performance, you know, so to speak, is, has limits, but also PyTorch, which of those are maybe better for certain problems and algorithms like, you know, using certain approaches for transfer learning or even hyperparameter optimization methods like Raytune I was alluding earlier. And the idea is that we share this with the community. So we see here that today we maybe focus on the quantum computing a little bit as a new form of hardware infrastructure. And basically very similar like we had already with the graph core intelligent, intelligent processing units. Another form of hardware infrastructure is quantum. Um, there the idea is contributing to some form of a unique AI framework that we will share with different download materials with the community having proven, let's say, different scripts, different tool sets for using AI at Exascale. And by doing so, we have different methodologies. We firstly focused on fact sheets to really gain and capture the main methods and the main ideas of the different use cases, followed by so-called interaction rooms, which then really go into much more details. Um, and of course, for these methodologies like the interaction room, we would have also a seminar available or a training in the YouTube channel, um, if you will. So please also here for everyone who was new here in our YouTube seminar today, please go to the channel and like it. We can use every like we basically can get. It's one of the measure of success of our U project. So please do that. And if you're interested, you find also different other trainings actually on this YouTube channel. So coming a little bit back where quantum now um, makes a difference, um, basically here we have this different ideas of different AI methods combined with um, essentially all the different use cases that we analyzed in the so-called application co-design process. We find out the different AI models here basically are several graph algorithms. We had, for instance, the last time as one example and today we will hear more about support vector machines, uh, which is just another, let's say, type of AI methods. We are basically uh, analyzing and looking where it can be used and which of the use cases it makes sense. And of course, here today also with a particular focus on quantum. So the, the key message to take away is that this raised um, idea of this unique AI framework is to provide you different pieces really from Jupyter notebooks up to um, a certain light with Python API that really abstracts a little bit from the complexities of all the underlying libraries you see here, like Horobot, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so forth, focusing perhaps a bit with ONNX to be also with industry compliance, basically with MLflow and ClearML pipelines. And here, the idea of quantum computing would be really to understand what new type of hardware architecture can you know, we bring into this framework to understand um, how we can use it because there are many of these systems already used in production like Jubels here in Jülich or Mare Nostrum in Barcelona, which you know provide container environments which are very powerful, which really scale with exascale. Now the question relies how the hardware infrastructure can be used here basically together with these, um, let's say established forms of computing. And here, of course, idea of the um, basically AI framework would be also to give you indicators and pointers how you can use quantum computers um, that are basically coming out today. And the basically overall idea is what you can, can get in the moment from our research is that you can use quantum computing right now, especially in the form of quantum annealers, as a kind of sort of accelerator 
where you have certain problems that you can, you know, basically use the quantum computing for or the D-wave systems here, quantum Manila as one example that will be also a little bit, you know, provided today. With this quantum support vector Python code, which would be not directly the same that we have, you know, in TensorFlow and the established libraries we know, um, or others like the parallel SVM here that is available for MPI and OpenMP. But of course, it will be a different tool set. But the key message to take away is that the AI model in it, like the SVM approach, is the same. So we have kernel methods, we have the idea of, you know, parameters having costs, allowing some error to happen, which makes it the maximum margin. A classifier in the end and a very good and robust approach in SVMs. So here we have the idea that the methodologies at least can be relatively simply ported, while of course the hardware technologies is completely different as I was alluding to with qubits and so on. This is certainly something which goes a little bit away from our large parallel file systems, from our ideas of using GPUs, um, which is that they'd say dominantly used these days in machine learning, I would say. And in this sense, um, we will learn today also that this hardware technology maybe can be a very good uh, complementary technology to those technologies we will face here. And I, as I was saying also in the beginning, um, modular supercomputing would hopefully enable us in one form or another to connect these quantum devices with general purpose computing or other forms of accelerators, right? As I said, with GPUs is one of the accelerators in the future, maybe for some problems, we use neuromorphic devices, and now we use maybe quantum devices for certain other problems like quantum optimization, I had already basically pointed out. And by this, we will change the scene a little bit of hardware infrastructures have been used in the past, and of course, follow another innovative thread. If you want to learn more, there's some publications here, but really my next speakers here in the webinar can talk much more hands-on experience than I can possibly transfer to you today. So it's my pleasure to welcome um, Amer and Eduardo that basically will talk intertwined here today to you with very interesting material on so-called quantum support vector machines. So Amer, are you ready? Or Eduardo, I'm not sure who is the first. Yes, okay, I'm going to share the screen. Excellent. Also for the audience, please be aware that we record the seminar while basically Amer is sharing. And also um, the questions would be nice to have in the end so that we have a nice discussions around these questions. But if you have some burning questions, of course, please feel free to put them in the chat. So that's all for me in the moment. Um, Amer, I think the floor is yours. If you can shortly introduce maybe both of you and make a short connection to AIDAS and ESA. I would be grateful. Otherwise, thank you very much for being here and enlighten us with, you know, basically your, your research. Thank you for the opportunity. So, um, good morning to everyone. My name is Ahmed Dvid Bazic and um, I, am, I work at the Yuri Supercomputer Center and I am a student, a PhD student at the University of Iceland. Um, Together with Eduardo Pasetto, uh, we are going to present uh, the, our, our PhD projects, uh, this part of the, of the projects uh, we are working on. Uh, the work we're presenting is uh, supported by, by RACE, of course, uh, by UNIQUE, which is the UNIQUE uh, Unified Infrastructure uh, for, uh, for quantum computing. And uh, it's also supported by uh, ESA, in particular, uh, the FILAB of the European Space, Space Agency, with which we collaborate uh, in, uh, for developing um, applications of quantum computing uh, for Earth observation. And then, of course, AIDAS, which is a collaboration between Forsen Centrum Munich and CEA Paris, uh, with, uh, which we, we do research on. Uh, Visual intelligence, data analytics, and uh, scalable uh, scalable simulations. Um, so, what is the main purpose of this uh, this presentation? As I mentioned is to present this work. So, to give an introduction, so that at the end you should uh, get a, a gist of what we are working on, and understanding the main ideas, concepts, and see if maybe those ideas may be also helpful 
for your work. So this is the, the outline of the, of the presentation. It's divided in two parts. Uh, the first part being more theoretical, and the second one being more concrete and um, focused on the, on the algorithms. So uh, I will start with, with a short introduction and uh, a description of adiabatic quantum computation. Then uh, Eduardo will uh, talk about quantum annealing, which is the main optimization uh, technique we use in our projects. Uh, then in the second part, we are um, uh, introducing what is a quantum superelector machine and how do we uh, apply this concept to two um, applications, that is classification and then uh, in the case of Eduardo, uh, regression. Uh, so um, Eduardo and me had the, the opportunity to work uh, on quantum computing for our master thesis, which was not much long time ago. And uh, we were thrilled by this idea because uh, as Professor Riedel mentioned, the quantum computing is uh, an emerging topic and a topic with very, very um, big expectations. Uh, or at least big potential. And um, uh, why we, we know this? Because uh, research has shown that uh, with quantum computing uh, and with this completely different um, paradigm, we are able to uh, develop algorithms, able to um, process data in a very different way uh, with respect to classical computers. And this will eventually lead to an exponential speed up in the, in the computation. So the idea is this. Uh, in classical computing, there are many different problems, each one with a particular uh, complexity. And there are some problems which are considered intractable with, uh, with, current, uh, uh, with current hardware. Um, for big uh, sizes of the problem. And these intractable problems are the main uh, target of, of, of quantum computing research as we can get an exponential speed up in, uh, in processing time. For example, uh, a classical algorithm which has a high complexity of O of two to the N, so an exponential complexity, can, uh, can have a quantum counterpart which has complexity O of N, so exponential speed up, or the same if we have a, a no n or a polynomial complexity in a, in, a, in a classical algorithm, we have a quantum algorithm which can have complexity of log of n. So uh, this, in theory, we can get uh, much more scalable algorithms for many different purposes and many different uh, practical applications like the one I mentioned here. Um, what is actually quantum computing? It's a, a bucket of very different uh, ways to process data, which all um, make use of uh, some principles and, uh, and postulates of quantum mechanics. Uh, so uh, like a, a framework uh, for processing data is called a computational model. And we have different computational models in quantum computing. Uh, the first one, at least, like in theory, is the quantum Turing machine, which is the, the, the basic um, theoretical model, which is the quantum counterpart of the classical Turing machine. Um, then we have a very popular model, which is also um, very popular in, uh, in today's research, uh, which is the quantum circuit model, where the data processing is modeled by uh, qubits and gates and circuits. So as we have in classical circuits, we have quantum circuit, circuits which process these uh, qubits, these information units of the, of the system, and uh, can perform um, all the required uh, calculations. There are many different ones, the measurement based quantum computing, topological quantum computing, but today we are uh, focusing on a specific computational model, which is adiabatic quantum computing. So I'm sorry for every one of you, who, which is a fan of uh, other models, but today we are using this framework to, to talk about quantum computing. 
However, this is not a big issue because uh, research, research has shown that these potential models are all equivalent. So we can perform any calculations, uh, any calculation, any algorithm uh, with them. And at the same time, they're also equivalent to the classical computational models. So the idea is that we, with classical computing, we can do every kind of calculations. It's a, a universal computational model. And also, quantum computational models are universal models. The only difference is in the way uh, and the, um, the postulates uh, on which quantum computational models are working, which eventually lead to uh, to uh, an a speed up in complexity. Uh, so let's talk about adiabatic quantum computation. The term adiabatic is uh, is borrowed by thermodynamics, uh, where uh, an adiabatic uh, process thermodynamics is a process where this system, this physical system, is isolated and has no energy exchange with the with the surrounding environment in terms of heat. Um, or matter. So this is the, the, the main idea of what a adiabatic process is, uh, as opposed, for example, to the isothermal process, which is basically just a process, a slow process where the temperature is maintained. So in, in the adiabatic process, we 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 preserve the um, the heat in this case of the of the system. That's a bit different um, to the adiabatic, uh, to the quantum adiabatic, adiabatic quantum computation, but this is just to, to, to give a reference to some previous knowledge you may have. Uh, because a quantum system uh, evolves in a very particular way. Um, we have uh, had this equation, which is one of the most uh, common one in uh, in quantum mechanics, which describes the, evolu the time evolution of uh, an isolated quantum system. And uh, what does this mean? Basically, that uh, we have uh, a state, which is, uh, which is the state of this isolated quantum system, which evolves in time. And it evolves uh, accordingly to a, a function, which is called Hamiltonian of this system, which corresponds to this physical quantum called the total energy system. So um, like the degree of variation in time of the, of, the, of the state of the system is proportional to the, um, to the value of this Hamiltonian. Uh, I won't go much into detail. I just want to mention that uh, we are able to describe the time evolution of quantum system. And uh, what is the idea of adiabatic quantum computing? Uh, we try, we try to build a quantum system that evolves in time, of course, and this time evolution, uh, as you know, is uh, ruled by, the, by this equation, in particular the Hamiltonian describing the system. So we change the, this Hamiltonian in order to do what we are trying to do and what we try to, to obtain. Uh, in particular, this Hamiltonian uh, encodes the problem and uh, this, um, this Hamiltonian should lead the, the system to a state which represents the solution of the problem we are trying to solve. It's a, a difficult concept, and it may be less intuitive than, for example, the, the, quantum, the quantum circuit model, uh, where we have some gates which takes the qubits in input and we know the output because we can compute it. With adiabatic quantum computation, everything is done, um, let's say, analogically. So we, we don't have a real connection with, with, with what is happening, but uh, it, is proved, it is proven that these two models, the adiabatic quantum computation and the, the quantum sequence model are equivalent. So we can do every uh, possible computation we need with these two models and just different in the way we formulate it, of course. But what, what is the idea? We start uh, uh, with a Hamiltonian at time zero, times t zero, which is easy. Okay, so an easy uh, Hamiltonian describing the energy of the system, where we can uh, find the, the ground state of the system. The ground state is 
basically one of the states uh, uh, that the system can, can assume, and it's the, the state with lowest uh, total energy. So it's the, the, the value, the, the state, the system naturally evolves to. So we, we try to um, set up the system in this very simple um, context. And then we change the Hamiltonian, as we mentioned, and uh, we uh, change it from time from time t zero uh, equal to zero and the time equal to t whatever, uh, and we try to uh, make that the final Hamiltonian we have is um, basically the Hamiltonian which describes the, our problem. So. Um, this Hamiltonian can be also very difficult Hamiltonian because it depends on the difficulty of the problem. But the idea is to slowly converge to it by starting with a simple one and then going to the to this difficult one, but the one we, we are trying to, to use for, for this for the for finding the solution to our problem. Um, this is a graphical scheme. It's very simple. It's a two qubit system with v1 and v2 where we have this Hamiltonian varying time we have this hi and hf which are the initial and the final ones the initial is a simple one the final is the the correct one let's say and we try to evolve it evolve the system to the to the final one so that the final state the, the system assumes is the state which encodes our solution the solution the output of our input which is the if you want to do it again. Okay. There's a rule we have to follow. That is, uh, we need to make this transition slow enough. Why? Because uh, there is a theorem called the adiabatic theorem, which uh, essentially says that if we maintain this, um, this time evolution slow enough, we keep the the system uh, to the ground state and this is what we're looking for because we're trying to solve this problem in terms of an optimization of a, of a function so what we want what we really want is is to have a slow enough uh, transition the one to the one to the first to the, to the second um, before I said that we can have whatever time we, we want, but it's not true. We actually, we need to uh, measure the state of the system only after a certain time. And uh, this time is bounded by this, this relation where uh, Jimin is the minimum energy gap between the first excited state and the ground state. So that the system can assume many uh, states. And um, it is basically. Uh, a method of measurement, so it's also a, a, an, uh, a random um, phenomenon. But if we have uh, a sufficient gap between the, the the ground state and the first excited state, so the one the state with the second the state with the second lowest energy, if, if this, this gap is big enough, we, we don't have to worry that much because uh, we we should eventually. I get the, the, the minimum uh, state with the with a high probability. Uh, if this gap is really really sm small, then we need to slow it down even more. And this is the main uh, limitation of the of the point computation that needs time. And um, so that's it. Um, there is another um, algorithm called the simulated annealing, which is basically a classic algorithm. And uh, it's a bit different from this quantum uh, dyadic evolution because um, what you are trying to do is to take a fixed function and through this uh, temperature uh, function, which is an energy function, we move in the in the um, in the solution space, and uh, eventually we, we arrive at the at the optimum of this, this function. And this is a, a helpful method if we have many, many local minima or maxima in this case. Um, 
so um, what is the main difference between these two methods? Uh, well, as I mentioned, in simulated annealing, we, uh, we try, we start with a, with a high energy uh, to a low energy uh, model where we keep the function constant and, uh, and then we eventually arrive at the global minimum, at the global best, let's say. In a quantum mathematical evolution, we always stay at the, at the minimum energy if we are good enough to, to keep the system at, at, the, at the ground level. And we just vary the, uh, the, the landscape, so the function we try to minimize, actually. So this is the, the main introduction to what Yevatic quantum computing is. Now uh, I will leave the floor to, to Eduardo, which will talk about quantum annealing. OK, so thank you, Omar. Uh, so now for the introduction, I would like to <coughs> spend a few words specifically on uh, quantum annealing and how quantum annealing is uh, implemented in, uh, for example, from the D-Wave, uh, so from the D-Wave framework that we use for our experiments, for our works. And I saw a brief, uh, give a brief high-level introduction. So uh, before, so to introduce uh, quantum annealing, it's important to remind that it's, uh, it's uh, very close, uh, closely related to adiabatic quantum computation. In fact, there is always this concept of an Hamiltonian that varies, an Hamiltonian which is also co constituted by the sum of, a, of an initial Hamiltonian and a problem Hamiltonian that encodes the problem we're trying to solve. So the only uh, difference that we, uh, that, we, uh, that, we are, that we are in quantum annealing is that uh, uh, the, the uh, so unlike uh, the body quantum computation, the system is not always guaranteed to stay to always remain in the in the in the ground state throughout the whole computation. So of course we are aiming to get the to get the, the system in a final state that is in a ground state. So we have a low solution which uh, hopefully corresponds to the to the solution of the immunization problem we're trying to solve here. The, but uh, so this this relaxation of the sorry can I have the next one? Uh, so yeah so we have this this uh, relaxation on the constraint that the that the that the system is not, is not always guaranteed to to remain in the in the in the ground state. This is actually the the main difference. Now, for now, in the next slide, I will just uh, so provide a very brief also introduction about the 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 infrastructure that we're using. So this actually I put here is the formula of the annealing schedule that we that is used by is the specifically by the D-wave annealer. So we have also the two terms here of the two Hamiltonians. Uh, which is also uh, whose strength is regulated by the two function a of, a of h of s and b of s. s is a, the is a value that goes from zero to one because it's the normalized time that also Mary introduced when talking with the quant adiabatic quantum computation. So the uh, the infl the the values of this function change throughout time. So uh, 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 specifically, the values of B, to B of S increases over time, while the values of, of H of S decreases over time, giving more importance to the problem Hamiltonian with respect to the, to the, to the initial Hamiltonian. So uh, another key uh, fa factor when considering quantum annealing is the type of problem and the mathematical framework that we're using, which specifically is uh, yeah, binary and uh, quadratic. So, uh, the problems that we, we, we that the Nila can uh, solve intrinsically are the problems that are that are corresponds to the model that I have shown here in the slide, which is the, called the Cubo, which stands for quadratic and constrained binary and optimization, which means as uh, as the as the name suggests that each uh, value, so each, each variable, okay, it's binary, so between uh, zero and one in this case, it's unconstrained, so which is which means that we can only solve unconstrained optimization. However, uh, as, as we, will, we will show in the next part of the presentation, it is possible with some uh, you know, uh, you know, device to, to, to devise some methods to enforce implicitly the constraints. So we cannot uh, enforce explicitly constraints, but for example, by manipulating the cost function itself, we can uh, somehow uh, implement uh, some sort of implicit constraint optimization, but uh, we will talk about it in more detail in the, in the next part of the slide. And yeah, uh, this formula that I put uh, here is, the, is a compact formulation of the, of the model. 
what you can see there are all the variables are the sum of, of, which, of, of all the variables, the binary, which are multiplied by the coefficient q the value of j, which is a coefficient that relates to the problem itself of the of the of, of these terms that 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 constitutes the, the cost function. Here we use this compact notation where each term is uh, is put is uh, constructed as, as an element of an upper triangular matrix Q, which is very important, which because it completely describes the our problem uh, the problem that we're trying to solve. So the problem is completely described by this uh, by this uh, matrix that is basically uh, basically where we so switch to each. Uh, which coefficient of other problem is associated also the the two values that correspond to the coefficients of the of the, sorry to the indexes of the variables. So this is actually what what we are trying to build, what we are what we need to to construct this structure when dealing with the cubo problem. So with this is so we need to anyway when dealing with uh, with uh, annealing problems, we always have to construct the problem in such a way because the the annealer can only solve problems uh, constructed in such a way. So another implementation also we, we could use uh, that is, uh, 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 yeah, it's uh, shown in the next slide, is the Ising spin model, which is an, an, an alternative implementation of the, uh, the binary uh, quadratic model, uh, which can be used uh, instead of Cubo. Both, both of them are fine for working with annealing. You can express uh, the real problem in, the, in the both ways. As you can see, they are both quadratic. And binary. The only difference is that the IC model, the binary values can take as value minus one and one, which instead of zero and one that are in the cubo. But yeah, they are equivalent model. The problems can be <coughs> can be expressed from uh, one model to another with a simple change of variable. So both of them are fine. For for this sort of consistency, we Namara and I we work with the cubo formulation because uh, previous work in the in the field of uh, quantum machine learning with annealing with quantum support machine employed this model. So for consistency, we just employed the cube, but it's just uh, they're both fine and equivalent. So going on with, uh, yeah, with the, with the, with the, D, uh, how, the D, how the annealing is in play with the D-Wave uh, D framework, this is actually a, a graph but that shows the values of the, of the two functions I talked before, the annealing schedule. As you can see here, uh, without uh, so without without now delving too much in the detail of the actual uh, values of the numbers, as you can see, the important thing to note here is that the the uh, value of h of s, which is the function that uh, controls the strength of the initial Hamiltonian, decreases over time, whereas uh, the strength of b of h of s, which which are I remind again, s is the normalized time that goes from zero to one, increases over time, which is the problem Hamiltonian. So. Here we also plotted here with this black line with the points where they are equivalent, so they have the same uh, the same strength. So also going on now, we like to spend a few words on the hardware infrastructure that we use uh, for the our our works with uh, annealing. So we Amar and I both use the Advantage system, which is the latest uh, uh, solver provided by the company D Wave. It was what released in late 2020. Is uh so is I think is the first commercially available annealer. Uh, Right now, we also have now uh, one in uh, ULIF. I will also spend a few words about that at the end of my presentation. So this uh, solver can use uh, uh, up to about uh, 5,000 qubits for his, uh, which correspond to the variables of the problems that I, that I talked about before, and 35,000 calculus. That the calculus are the uh, physical implementation that model the interaction between, uh, the, between the variables of the problems trying to optimize. So uh, now, so actually, this is actually a, a very, a very uh, brief uh, depiction of the structure of the, the quantum processing unit, which is actually the, the heart of our system where the, all the quantum computation is carried out. So as you can see, this is a graph where the variables of the, the qubits are, as, uh, are, uh, are represented by the nodes of this graph and the couplers are expressed by the uh, connection between, between these nodes. So I think that you might, you might have noticing for this image, which is a very important uh, uh, concept when dealing with quantum annealing is that, uh, as you can see, not every node is connected to all the others. Whereas if I run a problem on the annealer, I can have uh, as many interaction between the variables I, I could uh, think of. So this is actually a key point, in fact, of dealing with quantum annealing. In fact, 
sometimes, actually, I think that's almost, almost every time when dealing with a problem, there is no uh, uh, a direct, let's say, uh, you cannot directly embed your problem in the, in the, in the quantum processing units. Because as you, as you can see here, uh, not every node is it's fully connected to all the other nodes because it will be so advantageous for as 5,000 uh, nodes. It will be physically unfeasible to construct a, a quantum processing unit where, where each node is uh, fully connected to the other 4,999. So it will be actually impossible to be such, such a circuit. So the connection is limited. So when we have a problem that uh, here as best as a graph, because uh, uh, peculiarity of the cubic problem is that we can also express them as a graph because as, as we said before, they are binary, binary problems with, uh, with, uh, yeah, with, uh, which are, which are binary problems. So each variable can be expressed as a node where each node is assigned a value that corresponds to the linear term associated to, the, to, the, to, that, to that variable. And each uh, coupler, each, each interaction between variables can be expressed by a weighted edge in the graph. So our problem is try to embed this graph in the hardware structure. And how is this done if the, the structure is not uh, fully connected? We carry out an operation called minor embedding where each uh, variable of our problem is mapped to, a, it's called a group of qubits that is connected, it's called a chain of qubits. So we map the, the original variable to a problem to more than one qubits in order to increase the connectivity because of course, uh, if I have a problem that is fully connected, I, I need all, all possible connections. So I need to express the same element of my problem with a more uh, with a chain of elements in the hardware in the hardware structure. So uh, this is actually a very important feature of the problem because uh, this could limit actually the number of variables you can use. Because as I said before, so advanced system has uh, five thousand more more or less five thousand qubits, which correspond to the various variables of your problems. But if, if your problem presents many connection, of course you need to uh, go to apply a minor embedding procedure. And of course the, the actual number of variables you can carry out in your problems reduces a lot. For example, right now with advantage system are fully connected problems, which means that the, R, the graph is completely dense. Each variable connected to the other is uh, about 180 variables. So it's really, really much less than the, than the original variables. Also, this is actually a, a key, a key factor when considering the complexity of a problem. So because, of course, not only the number of variables itself is important when considering the complexity of a, of a cubic problem to be run in the annealer, because of course, as the number of variable increases, the possible number of uh, variable assignments, of course, grows exponentially because we have a, a bigger and uh, solution space in more dimension. But of course, it's always important to consider how the graph of the cubo is con how dense is the graph is connected because uh, uh, a dense graph will be very will be hard will be harder to be implemented of the other graph. So this is actually a a key parameter that we need to work on. And for example, we had uh, and I had this this kind of problem with our with our works with the super vector machine because uh, when dealing with super vector machines, uh, our problem is usually very very dense. So usually almost almost fully connected. So this actually a uh, it's a very it's a very the embedding and the uh, the bending limitation, I think, is one of the, from my personal experience, one of the key features, one of the key issues that you need to work with to try to, you know, to limit when working with uh, such an in systems. So now going a little on, I would also like to spend a few words about the software uh, framework of D-Wave. So especially the two main components of the, that are needed to run uh, problems with annealing, which are the D-Wave Leap, which is an, an ocean, an ocean uh, sorry, uh, sorry, a cloud service that is needed to access the D-Wave solvers. So basically, Leap is a cloud service where you can also register very, to create an account, you just need an email, and where you can, with this account, you, have a, you can buy some sub subscription plan where you have some computing time resources where you can, and every time you run a problem with your account, because you, when you run a problem, you need to use a token which is associated to an account, yeah, the number of the, the time of computational time of the that is run on the, the quantum process unit is detracted from your total time. So it actually is a, is a kind of, a, you can buy like computational resources on the D-Wave machines. Uh, the other component that is important for building with the, for building the software structure for the annealing system is the ocean, 
Ocean is a software library that uh, is uh, needed to build the software for you know, running and interacting with the solvers through, through LIP. So Ocean is available for Python language, mostly. There are also some API I've seen in the documentation in C++, but this is very, very, very minor. This is actually a, a very minority. So basically all the works that is done and all the codes that is done with annealing is mostly done and done in Python, which is also more convenient. We also, we told the, when constructing the problem itself and so on. So yeah, the that ocean is the, what you actually need to, to build the problem, to access the solver, uh, to set the parameters and everything. Uh, the, so the documentation is completely free. It's also the source code is available, so it can be very explored and investigated uh, freely from, from the website. So also going on, uh, I would also like to now spend a few words about the practical application of quantum annealing, because as uh, I said before, uh, quantum annealing is a meta heuristics for combinatorial optimization, intrinsically. Uh, so uh, what is this now is combinatorial optimization and why, did, why is this important for and of practical interest? So uh, combinatorial optimization by definition is that is a problem of solving which the solution space is discrete. So we can, uh, so by definition, we could always try out since it's discrete, uh, all solution for our problems and see and see what, uh, what is the best solution. However, if you, if you already work with uh, combinatorial optimization problems for real world application of practical interest, you may already know that uh, doing so is completely unfeasible for most problems of practical interest because uh, trying out uh, all possible solutions would be uh, completely unfeasible taking for some uh, real world cases like thousands of years or the most powerful, powerful machines available. So you need, to, you need to come up with a smart strategy to try to find a good solution for a problem uh, in a smart way. So here I was also uh, plotted two, for example, of the thing of the most famous uh, uh, combinatorial optimization problems that are the uh, minimum spending tree, which is related to the graph theory and the trivial system problem, which is uh, very, I think one of the most famous problem in, uh, in combinational, in combinatorial optimization, which is also already defined to find the shortest routes to visit all, all location in a, given, in a given map. So of course, as you, as you can imagine, uh, this these problems have a, a number of solution spaces grows uh, very fast as the number of uh, variables increases. So it is important uh, to find a good uh, heuristic to find those problems in a smart way. So for example, going on, uh, I also yeah in this uh, to point out the uh, combinatorial optimization problem with, with, uh, to express them with the analogy of. Uh, of energy minimization problems because uh, as as we can see uh, for each uh, solu for each uh, solution in the solution space for each configuration of the variables which corresponds to a solution we can associate an energy level which uh, uh, of course uh, which can be expressed as the height of a, of a landscape so basically if we express with this analogy the our solution space in the landscape what we're trying to do with the with the, uh, with, the, with the solving of this uh, discrete optimization problem, we're trying to find the valley when we are minimizing of this landscape where the solution can achieve the lowest energy of our problem. Uh, yeah, going a little on. Uh, yeah, this is actually, so we are now giving a final remark about quantum annealing in general, just to revise also, this also some, some of this concept also might apply to uh, quadratic quantum computing, because as I said, the quantum annealing is Closely relating in principle to quantum body quantum computing. So in both cases, for example, we uh, start with a, a with an Hamiltonian which is very simple to compute, which is a, a superposition of all the possible states. Then we evolve the system, which did with the with the uh, which evolves according as the Schrodinger equation, as uh, Amar said in his previous uh, in his previous uh, presentation. And then also we change throughout in this throughout the annealing time, which is the procedure which, where we change the value of the Hamiltonian, giving way way more importance to the problem Hamiltonian, which are which includes the problem we are trying to optimize. And then when the annealing procedure is uh, ended, we we want to find that is with the, that the uh, the system that is in a classical ground state is as uh, the lowest energy possible. Which uh, which uh, which we want to correspond to the actually a good solution for the minimization problem. So now going a little on, uh, I would like also to express a little bit how 
uh, how we are at the point of quantum annealing with respect to other quantum quantum computation technologies. Uh, so, however, before starting with uh, with this uh, analysis, it's important, in my opinion, to point out that quantum annealing is, uh, by definition, it's very different from, uh, for example, the gate-based quantum computation. So, in my opinion. So it's always important to consider this when making comparison between those technologies because they are very different in their uh, nature, for example, also because uh, at the quantum gate model is a, a universal model of computation, whereas quantum annealing is a, a more an, an optimizer for combinatorial optimization problems. So sometimes, in my opinion, it's very hard to compare those things due to the difference in nature. So anyway, as you can see here, we uh, we plotted a, a basically a graph that that associates each technology to its quantum readiness level with respect to these technology technological implementation, and we can see here that, for example, the D-way quantum quantum annealing is at the stage eight, which is uh, which is almost the uh, the the which is at, at, at the at the top of this pyramid of readiness of quantum, which has a, 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 a scalable version of uh, Quantum computing, which is very, which is also evident in the quantum uh, the, in the D-wave uh, products, because for example, if we look at uh, how the D-wave machine increased the number of qubits over time, we have almost a more or less exponential growth. For example, uh, the latest the solver D-wave advantage as uh, five thousand qubits. Its predecessor, the D-wave two thousand Q, which was released uh, three times three three years before, as two thousand qubits. So we have more than double the number of qubits in uh, three years. Also the predecessor of 2000 Q, which I do not remember the, the name, as like um, about maybe 1000 qubits. So we also have a doubling in its uh, number. Also the first solvers were about hundreds of qubits. So we have over uh, in the like you no know, 10 to 15 years, we have a, we had a exponential growth. So we don't know actually how, if this will, the growth will continue and for how much, but for now, uh, concerning scalability, quantum annealing uh, proved to be very scalable in the number of qubits. Uh, yeah, for example, we also uh, also now uh, plotted, for example, for comparison, the EBM, which is uh, in Google, which are more focused on gate-based quantum computing, which are on a readiness level that is uh, more intermediate. So we are on the level four and five, so which is actually a more, but uh, as I said before, it's always different to, uh, difficult, sorry, to, uh, make comparison between those technologies because, of course, they are different in nature. And so now I would like also to end my presentation with spending a few words about the quantum infrastructure in ULIC. Uh, we have a Fortune Centrum ULIC, and how it is, uh, how it is, uh, uh, so how it is, how it communicates with the more general HPC infrastructure that we have in ULIC. So, because as you, as we can see here in this little plot here. We have uh, the our HPC system can, is uh, can be divided in different modules uh, with uh, different computational resources, and we have the model number five, which is related to the UNIC, which is the UNIC Unified uh, Infrastructure for Quantum Computation, uh, inserting this it, it, uh, in this different uh, infrastructure here, which is in the in the G, which is related also to the GSC, which is our our institute at uh, UNIC. So now going now we like to zoom in with the in the unique uh, unique for example I talked about the D-wave annealer but there are other quantum hardware that are present in ULIC. for example the quantum simulator we have the experimental and ISQ devices uh, which of course are we are trying to integrate in this supercomputing environment trying to find the find the the best of two worlds trying to find a, how to because how to how quantum uh, computer could enhance uh, existing uh, computational framework because uh, this actually give me a uh, give me the opportunity to introduce a key concept in my opinion on uh, quantum computation technologies that is that uh, the aim of quantum computation technology is not to uh, replace of course at all the classical computational resources but instead to collaborate <coughs> so because the key idea in fact this actually the, the slide uh, explains very well is to build a framework that uh, can take the best of two words that, for example, can uh, uh, take uh, uh, these new technologies that are quantum to enhance existing, existing, uh, existing technologies and to build a better framework that is uh, more diverse, more robust and everything. 
So how this is done, this is actually a very good question. It's actually a, what, the, what we are doing in our research at the GSC, how to find the best these two worlds and integrate, integrate them together. And so, and finally, I would like with the next slide here, conclude with a very brief uh, image of the building that we have in ULIF where the advantage is stored. As you can see here, this is the building for the external building from uh, a view. It's located in the center of the Fortune Center ULIF. And inside there is this advantage system. Uh, the advantage system present in ULIF is the, <coughs> is the first of, of uh, such system that is uh, in, available in Europe. Is the first in Europe. We really have the first advantage system in Europe. And also the quantum infrastructure in the next years is planned to, to also to be more developed with other technology. But uh, yeah, this is actually regarding quantum manning, we have the first one in Europe to have uh, such a machine available. And so this actually, uh, I conclude the, our, my presentation for the first part. And then in the next part, we also dwell deeper into actually our algorithm that we develop for our, for our work with super vector machines. And thank you very much for, for your attention. Okay, if there are no issues, we can go on with the second part, which is the most okay. one. Okay. Um, I don't know if, this is, this is okay. Yeah, yeah. If, if there are any questions, maybe also we can also ask them later with after the okay. second part. Is yeah. it's it's okay? Also, maybe we can do a break now. I don't know. It's uh, both both them are, are fine. So it's yeah. Usually we don't really have a break because you know we have just two hours uh, ah, okay. of the training. So I think if you want, okay. we can do a five minutes comfort break or bio break, as it's called, um, and then we proceed maybe just in five minutes. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so we will uh, we, uh, be, we will start in five minutes with the second part. Okay. Yes, yeah. Okay, Let's okay, do thank that. you. Okay.
<clears throat> so I think we should slowly come back. Do I turn the email on here? If you are there. Yes. Exactly. Okay. I think we will ask Michael to cut that part a bit out <laughs> for the YouTube. But anyway, that's that's okay. So basically, I would just say continue with the second part, right? Have in mind that we maybe need a little bit of time of discussion. So if you can do it a bit shorter than okay. 40 minutes, um, you know, a bit sh short Q&A session. And I also want to make a point of our next seminar, which just takes five minutes. But uh, yeah, if you can do it around in half an hour, so 10 before 11 or something, that would be good. Usually okay. there are not many questions and I see many friends here on the call. So maybe there's not mm. much questions. No, All right. To be Good, a then. Yes. Oh, please. Sorry. Okay. No, uh, now that we introduced the, the theoretical concepts uh, supporting our uh, applications, now we are going to the most interesting part, uh, which is uh, the quantum support vector machine. Uh, we are talking about uh, a machine learning algorithm. In particular, um, uh, a class of algorithms which uh, uses the theory of the classical super vector machine and leverages quantum uh, computing uh, to enhance a part or the, the, the whole uh, um, algorithm behind it. Um, so these are three of the most famous uh, contributions to the quantum super vector machines. And, uh, um, the three of them are all different in the structure, the ideas, and uh, the results. So I will try to, to make uh, a little, uh, like to, to clarify uh, what those differences are. But to do so, we start with the first uh, contribution that is uh, this 2003 paper uh, where um, quantum computing is used for enhancing the training of the of the SVM, uh, particularly uses uh, a variation of uh, of the of the search of the Kruger search algorithm to, to find the the, um, the support vectors of the of the of the training set. So uh, the idea is to enhance the training step of the, of the algorithm. Um, so this is one of the the, the, the possibilities. In literature, we can um, distinguish a quantum super vector machine um, according to these categories. So, uh, which is the SVM, the classical SVM algorithm we are considering, which, for example, are the SVM for classification or the SVM for progression, uh, which uh, quantum computing technology we are using, and uh, how we are formulating it. So, if, if, we are, if we are formulating an algorithm in terms of secrets and qubits or in terms of uh, problem to be solved, an optimization problem to be solved with annealing. And um, another uh, key aspect is what we are doing with this, uh, with this quantum computing technology. So what are the benefits it brings to our algorithm? It may be, for example, as we mentioned, enhance the training or build uh, a kernel, a kernel, a quantum kernel, um, in, a, in an optimized way, or uh, even um, transforming the whole algorithm in a quantum algorithm. And so we need, we start from quantum data and we perform uh, all the, the process, uh, the training and the classification process. And then at the end, we get even uh, also quantum data, so a full quantum um, structure. Uh, while this last um, idea is very interesting and uh, also uh, very promising, as it uh, like it uh, tries to uh, implement uh, the the exponential speed up uh, we talked about before. So we know that the classical SVM has a time complexity, a polynomial complexity, around uh, around O of n to the third. So it's basically yeah, a cubic um, complexity uh, respect uh, respect to to the to the dimension of the, of the training and uh, the training set, 
And uh, if we if we build the full quantum algorithm as uh, proposed uh, in the in this paper, the quantum supervisor machine for the classification, we are able to reach a logarithmic complexity. Uh, however, mm, this idea is very very far fetched, and uh, it requires a number of uh, physical and hardware um, resources we uh, we we don't have. We don't have with this uh, with the, the desired level of uh, accuracy and level of error correction and, and the, the readiness level Eduardo mentioned before. So we have to uh, focus on some maybe more limited uh, aspects of it, but also more powerful and more uh, feasible today. Uh, in fact, we are uh, considering both classification and regression uh, SVMs, um, but uh, we are leveraging quantum annealing, so the, the, the specific technology uh, uh, support provided by, by D-Wave for enhancing the training of these models. So we are basically proposing um, training, quantum algorithms for training. Um, so this is the, the idea. OK, mm, just a brief recap of what SVM is. I know maybe <laughs> most of you know it, but just to, to clarify the difference, we have two main, um, main uh, buckets, uh, the SVMs for binary classification. OK, we have the classification and the regression uh, SVMs. I will mainly talk about the classification part, and Eduardo will talk about regression. So in the realm of uh, SVM classification, um, sorry, supervised classification uh, using a simple vector machine algorithm for training, we have um, we can perform binary classification or multiple class classification and multi-class classification. In the binary classification, which is the the, the most famous uh, uh, the most famous uh, formulation, my opinion is. That we we need we have this hyperplane which divides the and the solution space into subregions and the, the classifier just um, performs this uh, the prediction on new new uh, samples by considering in which subregion it uh, it lies. Um, on the other hand, the multi-class classification is a bit different, and it may vary a lot in a sense that uh, there are two main approaches. The first one, which is also the most famous one, is the multiple step uh, approach, uh, so-called multiple step approach. Why? Because we have multiple uh, binary classifiers, which uh, divide the training set in, a, uh, in pairs of uh, training sets and uh, combine these classifications uh, steps in order to perform the final, the desired result, which is a multiple class classification. And this is the, the most uh, popular way, most famous and most used, and also the simplest, let's say, because it's just a, a combination of binary classifiers, which are already known and, and developed. Um, however, uh, there is uh, another type of multi-class SVMs, uh, which are so-called single step uh, approaches where we just perform a single optimization step, so a single um, training phase, and we are able, we are already able to um, to create a, a classifier uh, which classifies between C classes. So this is this may be a, a, a great a good idea, but uh, the training. Uh, this single training step is much more complex and it doesn't scale very well in, uh, in, in increasing the number of classes and the number of examples. So uh, this particular um, direction, uh, particularly one uh, I mentioned here, the Kramer-Singer uh, algorithm, uh, have been neglected in literature because they were unfeasible with the, with the, with the hardware we, we had and generally classical hardware. Uh, the idea is, OK, um, since the training is one of the most uh, demanding uh, steps of the SVM, in particular of, the, of this, uh, this Kramer single algorithm 
why don't you use quantum computing to enhance it? And why don't we use the, the, the most mature technology, uh, which the, the quantum annealing technology we, we already have and we, we have learned about? Well, uh, there's a big issue. Uh, as Eduardo correctly mentioned before, we can only work with uh, optimization problems in a form of a cubo problem, so a quadratic and constrained binary optimization problem. Uh, however, SVM is not a cubo problem. It's uh, a quadratic optimization, yeah, okay, we know that. This, the, the dual formulation can be uh, formulated as a, a quadratic problem, but we have some constraints, so it's not unconstrained. And we, we don't have binary variables. We don't have zeros and ones, but we have real variables. So um, this is a, 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 an aspect we have to consider. And the first reaction uh, could be, OK, we can do anything about this. OK, let's move on. But this is not true, because we can still try to um, change the problem a little bit in order to make it a cubo problem. This is the most um, the, the go-to uh, approach for our for um, implementing um, quantum annealing in uh, in machine learning in uh, for example in the SVM um, part. But uh, we need to to understand that this is just a a way to solve problems, but it we we are not. Uh, Pretending to solve the, the correct one and the and the real SVM problem, we are just solving a, a related problem, a reformulation of it, which is a cubo. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it is exactly the problem that we are, we are aiming, aiming for. We try to be as accurate as possible, but this is uh, still an, an, an ongoing uh, research uh, topic. Um, so because. Uh, we, we we were talking about uh, quantum computing as a way to implement uh, exponential speed up. However, it, uh, we know that the cubo problem in a like with classical hardware means that we have to try all the combinations of zeros and ones, and it, it has exponential speed up. So if we have a native cubo problem, we can easily um, uh, speed it up with with quantum annealing and get an exponential speed up. But this is not true if we have a problem which is, for example, is just a, a quadratic programming problem, which is even not um, exponential in complexity. It's polynomial, but it's still complex, but it's not exponential. So uh, it's a, the, the, the topic about uh, the topic of uh, exp of exponential speed up is a bit little bit different here. We still try to 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 build uh, a, a faster uh, training algorithm, but we are not aiming for the best performance possible. So uh, our purpose was not to obtain an exponential speed up, but just to um, see how quantum learning works in this uh, particular context. If can be uh, uh, applied, and if we can actually get good results, and how would it be? And how? Uh, what are what are the procedures? What are the the best practices to make it work? Okay, so this is the general workflow adopted by the literature. Uh, so we we basically try to create uh, a binary encoding of the of the, the variables. So we we try to build some zeros and ones and binary variables which encode the variables of the problem. Then we we try to um, add a penalty term to this uh, to this cubo problem, which implements the um, the constraints which are present, but we don't need we, we can't uh, deal with them as constraints because the cubo doesn't have constraints. And then uh, we uh, build the cubo matrix, which completely defines the problem. So, so this is the general workflow. Uh, we will see exactly how this works in uh, in our in in the SVM for classification. So um, regarding the binary SVM, so the, the SVM for binary classification, we have uh, a non-optimization problem, which is this one. This is the final result 
our goal with the details. Uh, this is the, the dual formulation where we have these variables, alphas, which are uh, real variables. And uh, we have these two constraints. So uh, those are the two problems we have, real variables and we have constraints. So how do we deal with, with this? With this, we need to use quantum. We want to use quantum annealing to solve this optimization problem, but we can submit it as it is. We have to reframe it as a cubic problem. This is the idea. So, uh, in the three test steps, the first one is uh, creating the binary variables, so encoding the variables into binary variables. Uh, okay, so so this is the scheme. Uh, we we create binary uh, variables, with, uh, call, which I called A. And uh, we make that these binary variables, zero and ones, can, um, uh, like, through some computation, can uh, be related to the original ones, which are real. We, we won't get the whole solution space because we have uh, a discrete number of variables, but we will get some samples in this uh, real space of, of solutions. Um, in fact, if we, if we sample this real space into a lot, a lot of points, we get even better results. Otherwise, we can get maybe suboptimal results. But uh, if we use less variables, as Eduardo mentioned, it's uh, easier for us to embed the problem into the, the, the quantum annealer, which, which is a limited machine uh, in terms of memory. Then we have these. We have also the constraints, but uh, we, uh, the the key aspect is that we we have we need to inject these uh, constraints directly in the energy function. So make that if the constraints are not satisfied, we get a higher, a higher energy system. So since the the quantum annealer naturally evolves to the low energy, it will automatically make the, the constraint satisfied. So this is a way to do it. Since the, the um, here, for example, this, uh, this constraint is just uh, an equation. So we need this quantity to be equal to 0. So the, the more this quantity is distant from 0, it's different from 0, we have an increase in the energy. And the, 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 the straight, most straightforward way to do it is to take the square of this and add it as a penalty term. So this is just the re uh, reframing of the alphas as binary variables, as, as we did here. I won't go much into detail uh, in, the, in the mathematical aspect because there, is, there are some papers about it, but we, we try only to get like, the essence of, the, of what we have to do before uh, submitting a problem to a quantum annealer. We have to do some pen and paper work. Like this, and then uh, we create the human matrix by uh, taking the, the original energy function and adding the penalty term, and we realize that we get a cubic problem as we wanted. So the two match. Um, so here is that just I want just to, to to say that the key is finding these alphas. So if we find these alphas, we find the uh, the classifier because you know. Uh, in the SVM, if we get this, these variables, then we, we can build a classifier. The classifier can uh, create, we can generate some outputs from uh, new inputs. And uh, you take this, this y, uh, y hat, and uh, we check the sign of this y. If, the, if it is greater than zero, we assign it to a class plus one. If it is, it is less than zero, it, it is assigned to minus one. So the idea is that finding these variables is sufficient for creating our, our um, classifier. And how do we find them? By submitting the problem to the annealer. The annealer will just uh, return the, the results, so the, the alphas, which hopefully minimize the energy function we formulated here in terms of a cubic problem. Um, later, I will, I will exp uh, explain a little bit how this, this works, so how the annealing phase works. Uh, here, we just mentioned uh, Another uh, application case, which is the multi-class SVM, in particular the Kramer-Singer SVM we were talking about, and uh, showing you what it is about, because maybe it's not that, also it's not that common. Um, 
here we have similarly an optimization problem in, in a, uh, which in the deal formulation is a quadratic uh, optimization problem uh, with some constraints. What is the difference between the, the multi-class and the binary one? In this case, we are not dealing with hyperplanes, but we're dealing with some generalized margins. So we're not trying to minimize to maximize the distance uh, between the hyperplane and the and the samples, but we're trying to maximize um, the distance uh, between uh, a class and the other in this generalized margin bound. I, I, will, I will explain uh, this a bit later. Actually, it's the next slide. So uh, this classifier um, doesn't generate a hyperplane, but just um, an output of C uh, values with C number of classes. So this classifier, uh, the classifier takes as input the, the variables we found, we found, and then it returns as output C values. For example, one, zero, minus three, I don't know. And we try to, you will be check all the, these outputs for a single input and we say, okay, uh, the prediction, so the class we, we predict for the input is the one that has the, the maximum value in this, in this output. So if y1 is one and all the others are less than one, then we classify the input as class one. So the, the, the idea is that we, we try to to keep the, uh, the maximum, to keep sufficient distance between one output and the other. So uh, the, 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 max, the minimum difference between the correct one and the others has to be at least one, let's say. So this, this is the idea, but this, this is just a, a machine learning concept, just to, to introduce you to this new concept of, of margin. Um, yeah, but the idea is exactly the same. We have an, an optimization problem. We have the same problems. We uh, same issues. Let's say um, it has real variables, and these real variables also are uh, in some constraints. And but in this case, these variables are not real. Well, they are, they are, they are real, but they are just bounded between uh, minus one and one. So they cannot assume any value, a possible value, but just a value between minus one and one. So uh, the binary encoding can be easily represented like this. We have this minus one, one space, and we just say, okay, we don't take all the whole solution space. We just take some samples, uh, which are, for example, encoding in this way. We have these two qubits. And according to the value of these qubits, we can express a value of the of the of our variables in this way, in a, in a sort of um, uniform sampling of the space. The penalty term works in the same way. I won't go much into detail. We have uh, uh, two constraints, and we try to to make them increase as the the constraints are far from being satisfied. And we add this penalty term to the total energy we're trying to minimize. So uh, we try to minimize both one and the other and um, by summing them up. And there are, I, I didn't put the, the results here, but believe me, at the end, we reach a cubo problem in this form where we have a matrix which completely describes the problem. So what we do with this cube of matrix. We submit it to the, the quantum annealer using the, the ocean library. And uh, the annealer performs this uh, optimization many times. In fact, we can decide how many times we, we, we want to, uh, to make this uh, process go on. And uh, this is the, the aspect we need to uh, run this, this algorithm for as many times as we need because uh, we are not sure that by running it once, we get the best result. Uh, also because this is a quantum machine, so we need to, to do some probabilistic, some statistic analysis. Those are some two of the results. And we see that we like the, the algorithm works properly. So it's properly formulated. And we, we, we can also get some good results. And sometimes also comparable to the classical one, or even better in some cases. But this is not, not, not the aspect we want to discuss. We want just to say, OK, uh, what are the, um, the aspects we need to care of when you are, when you are doing um, classification with uh, quantum annealing? 
So the first one I already mentioned before is that we need to keep it small. So we can have infinite or well, big number of training examples. We cannot have a lot of classes. We cannot have a, a sample, a, use a, many qubits for each sample. And so increase the, the sampling of the, of the solution space. We need to, to find a trade-off. Uh, also considering the, the main constraint of memory. Uh, another problem is that um, we need, as I mentioned, to, to perform this uh, uh, annealing process many times. And each time we will get a sample, and each sample ha will have a particular meaning. And um, the best way to, to make use of this information is combine all these, these solutions, because each one we will, will be probably among the, the minimum, the minima of the, of the optimization problem. So each one can, in fact, be important in our, in our, our context. And uh, the third aspect is that we don't know exactly which solution is better than the other. There are some solutions which are more into the, the minimum, so they have minimum, minimum energy or less energy than the others. But this does not, does not necessarily um, translate into a better results for our specification purposes showed here. Uh, so this is another, another ongoing issue with it. We need, we need to better and better understand the relation between the energy of the, of the quantum annealer and the related accuracy we get with the results. So those are just some uh, ideas I wanted to, to share with you. We are working on it, and uh, now Eduardo will uh, talk about his experience with regression. Okay. So now we'll uh, just very go very briefly because of the <coughs> we're very very briefly with the with the regression. Also, we we very 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 fast of some of some aspects because uh, we, as we can see in my presentation, so many key concepts that Amer uh, explained in his presentation can be somehow apply it also to my case. So maybe I don't want to spend so much time on those and just to try uh, to get like the, the main idea about that. So the, uh, this is actually, I got here, but I don't want to spend so much time about, the, about that is the, for just for reference is the uh, initial uh, uh, cost function I'm trying to minimize uh, uh, with, uh, with, 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 some of the, with the constraints that are need to be enforced during the minim minimization. So here, uh, yeah, I just don't want to spend so much time. Those, the most important thing to know is that uh, this is a continuous problem. It is a constrained problem. So to turn that into the, in a cube problem, I need to apply a procedure similar to what that Amer described for his, uh, for, his, uh, for his work. And basically, the workflow is more or less the same. We add uh, penalty terms to the cost function to implicitly uh, satisfy the constraint without explicitly telling the function to uh, satisfy them. Then we apply the binary coding equation, which are more or less the same as the one that used Amer. There's only one key difference that we maybe, maybe I would just uh, uh, focus on that when I explain encoding. And then we have the cubomatics definition, which is actually we need, as I said before, we need uh, when dealing with cubo parameters, we need to finally to get the, to get the metrics with the, which encodes the, the problem. So now going on, uh, uh, and now we just so spent a few times about the penalty terms and the and how in general how the constraints are satisfied. So the bulk constraints are easily satisfied because uh, as we can see uh, from I will see later from the encoding equation the maximum value that each variable can take is expressed by this quantity here. It is equal to c equal to uh, basically this summation of from e i zero to k to k minus one of b to the power of i is the maximum value by definition that this variable can take. So by setting a value of c that is a greater or equal of this quantity, uh, it uh, always allows me to, uh, uh, to know that the constraint are satisfied because uh, the variables are uh, by definition uh, not allowed to take a more value greater than this. Uh, whereas concerning the, the constraints, we have the penalty terms. One penalty term is a square penalty term controlled by the parameter c. That is related to the constraint, to the third constraint, and moreover, we also add another uh, exactly that, that one in the previous slide. And moreover, we also add another penalty term which is controlled by the parameter that I call beta, which is not a, an explicit constraint, but it's a constraint that is uh, need to be satisfied itself following the KKT condition of uh, constant optimization. 
which says that it's from for each n uh, value of n, either uh, a of n or either a, a hat of n must be equal to zero. Therefore, the product was, must be equal to zero. So this is actually where this constraint comes, comes in mind. The only key difference from that is that uh, uh, to ensure that the final problem is a quadratic problem, I need uh, I have to add it as a linear penalty term because uh, as you as you can see from the equation here, if I instead used a quadratic penalty terms, uh, of course uh, the I would uh, have a uh, uh, more than quadratic terms in my cubo, which is not possible by the linear the formulation. So now also going on, so I would now uh, like to spend a few words about the encoding. So the encoding, as you might notice, is the is the exactly more or less the same procedure that I used. The only key difference here is that uh, for the regression, uh, the regression for a problem itself, that's derived from the regression equation, the regression training equation, I don't have uh, the number of original variables alpha that is equal to the to the number n of training sample as in the sub SVM for classification, but I have twice the number of alpha uh, as the number of training samples. So you have a uh, two n training samples alpha. So how do so, and since I encode each of these alpha, uh, either a alpha or alpha hat, which k uh, qubit variables, I need a total of two k, two times k times n uh, uh, logical variables for my cubo. So how do I encode that? I use the first k of n variables to encode the alpha n, and the second and the last k of n to encode the, to encode the alpha hat of n. So this actually, as you see, for example, for the alpha hat, the encoding starts with uh, k times capital N, which is the number of variables, and uh, plus n, meaning that the encoding starts with the second k of n variables. That, but the encoding procedure, as you can see, is the same, and is also the same that Amari used for his uh, encoding for the classification case. The only difference that I use is that uh, I sometimes, somehow, sometimes I use a, a value for of b different from two. For example, in some of my experiments, I use five, four or five, but yeah, the structure is completely the same. So completely, encode state, completely the same encoding procedure. And now this is actually, I want to go very, very briefly with this because I don't want to spend so much time of this because I think it's beyond the scope of this course, of this meeting, of this webinar, I just put it there for completeness. So here is just the initial equation that I showed in the first slide after adding the penalty terms and after applying the the encoding equation. So it's actually, it's very also trivial. It's just simple basic algebra, more or less. The what what uh, I want to focus here is that now this very long equation, uh, as you can see, <coughs> sorry, can be expressed now as a cubo because if, as you can notice here, uh, as the form of a cubo problem. Uh, so also now I want also to go very very fast on this. Uh, this is actually the an algorithmic, a practical point of view, especially with uh, with regard to coding, with uh, how to implement with a code to how to construct the Q matrix. So, oh, again, I don't want to spend so much time on this computation because it, I think it's not very useful for this webinar. So anyway, the thing here is that okay, uh, as you can see by varying the this indexes with uh, with a four cycle in your code, for example, uh, I can reach all the elements of this uh, intermediate matrix Q tilde. So for each uh, index assignment, I can calculate this uh, value with this formula. And now, so with the first, with nested for cycle, I can now calculate each element of this Q tilde matrix. And now, once I created this Q tilde, I, I turn this Q tilde in this matrix Q, which is upper, upper triangular matrix by applying this very simple rule. And this upper triangular matrix Q is the, is the final matrix of the cubic problem that is needed to solve the problem that now I feed to the annealer, let's say. So uh, now also maybe now I'll go very, very uh, quick on this because of uh, time, uh, 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 because of uh, time problems here. And so when dealing with the advantage system and directly with the QPU, you get a number of solutions that are sampled from the, from the solver and the number you can set them with some parameters in your code. And what, uh, and what you need to do, in my opinion, is how to fuse those uh, solutions together to obtain the final solution. So what I do, what I did here is a very, very trivial, trivial thing. It is just, I, I, I thought about uh, why not to do the most common thing, which is a, a simple weighted average of the solution. 
And basically, I came up with six methods, but other maybe can be developers in future. Also, sometimes I'm developing, uh, maybe getting ideas for new ones. So basically, the main idea, uh, I also don't want to maybe go into detail of everyone, is to basically, uh, after I trained the, the machine, so which solution I have a set of, uh, of variables, that I take with a set of classified uh, regressors. I test each regressors on the training set. Then I calculate a loss function with, uh, with the actual values. This loss function, of course, permits me to assign them a, a score, let's say a merit to each, uh, to each solution. Of course, we following a rule in such a way that uh, the lower the value of the loss function, of course, the higher the value of the credit that the solution gets. And then answer, once I have these, uh, maybe, maybe let's uh, like merit values, credit values, I need to uh, make them as coefficients of a convex, convex uh, uh, combination, which means that each of them is greater than zero. They must be each of them be also uh, uh, lesser, uh, great, uh, uh, sorry, low, lower or equal than one, and their sum must be equal to one. And I would do the, I would do this basically with some strategies that are uh, either I divide uh, I divide each each score for each for the sum of all of them. Therefore, reaching out in such a way that is uh, the sum is equal to one, or I simply apply a softmax, which of course by definition uh, gives me the coefficient of a of a complex combination here. Uh, also, I come uh, uh, yeah. Also, I come out with other last two strategies are the quite the opposite. The first one is uh, everyone gets gets the same credit, which is a simple average. Or the quite the opposite is that uh, I only consider the best one. So I discard all the others and I consider that the complete LT solution and uh, no elitism at all. So that everyone gets is the gets the, the 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 equal credit. This is actually a two extreme and uh, the other methods are intermediate things between them. So now uh, I would like also to uh, provide you with some maybe graphical results about my regression. I chose to bring to you uh, these uh, these pictures because uh, these are related to a to a, to a very simple case where we apply the regression to a one variable function, more specifically a sine function with a frequency equal to two and a sync function with uh, an amplitude which is uh, five, five times the usual amplitude. So as you can see here, I've also put in the legend, we have the actual values in blue, the one to my sphere in green. Here for simplicity, without in order to avoid uh, too much clutter in the, in the pictures, I only, uh, Put the, put the best results for each uh, solution combination method. So I only put here, the only the solution combination methods to achieve the best results. And in green, finally, you can see the SVR, the classical SVR performance trained on the same problem. As you can see here, uh, this actually so are very simple functions. So maybe are not so much particular interest or in general, but I think it's very, it's a good starting point to understand the potentiality of, of this measure. As you can see here, uh, I think it did a pretty good job. The quantum, the quantum version did a very, a very good job because it uh, uh, approximated the original function very similar to the, the, the to the classical counterpart. Also, they both achieved a very good, in my opinion, uh, 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 graphical approximation of the original function. And to conclude here, uh, sorry if I had to maybe to go very fast, but you know the time it was very tight. I had to maybe add some final consideration about quantum supervised regression. And maybe some of the things may, may also apply to the uh, supervised machine for classification because they are very closely related. So uh, the first problem, which is also what Amer said, but is, in my opinion, is very important to remind that is that uh, quantum annealing is designed for a combinatorial optimization. Uh, and whereas the SVR <coughs> is intrinsically uh, uh, Solution problem. So uh, adaptation of the problem must be uh, must be done in order to apply this. And so the problem we are trying to solve is uh, is uh, is uh, is very different for the reason why. And nevertheless, we managed to obtain uh, quite good results, more or less. And so I think this is very indicative of the power of quantum annealing in this case, because uh, even though we had a machine that is completely designed for Quite the opposite, in my opinion, because we are machine designed for unconstrained and, and combinatorial optimization. We somehow made optimization. So this is a very indicative of his, of his power. 
and also uh, yeah i think it was power and if adaptability and everything of course there are some problems which are very uh, which is i think in my opinion it's very pointless to try to solve it with an either because it's simply it's uh, it cannot be done in an efficient way but in my opinion there are many other problems that can be done efficiently on the annealer uh, from my also from, from experience, what I noticed from the data is that the hyperparameters must be set correctly. Not only the hyperparameters related to the to the annealing, uh, which is like the day, the value of B, the value of K, and everything, but also the part, the value of the support vector regression itself, like the value of gamma for the kernel, the value of C for the overfitting and everything. Because in my opinion, annealing is uh, having a more limited solution space. In my opinion, is more sensible to the hyperparameters. So, uh, choice. So you, if you work with uh, annealing, you have to you have to tune the hyperparameters very correctly if you want to get the best of this uh, machine. And finally, this is actually a crucial part of this uh, algorithm: is that the for the separate vector regression, the problem, as I as I maybe as I also introduced before in the previous part, is always is most most of the time fully connected. And this actually limits the number of actual values, actual number of, uh, sorry, actual variables we can uh, encode in our QPU and uh, affects also the problem of the, the dimension of the problem itself. And that could be a crucial part, but uh, in fact, maybe there are, I, the last also part I was trying to come up with some creative solution to how to cope with this, maybe for uh, reprocessing or everything, which also now also connects to this uh, final conclusion here. And they're just to cope with the problem of these uh, limited variables we can use. So now also like to conclude to propose some like uh, like some points to maybe to reflect about the con uh, to the future developments of this uh, this machine. So uh, also the the a key concept here, I think the one of the most key concepts is that uh, the annealer will is uh, is best used in a hybrid framework. For example, also the DUA provides you with some uh, hybrid solvers, which implements both classical and quantum resources. Uh, you it also, it's very portable for your code because they also get as an input the same uh, the same cubo that you need to use with the direct review. The only thing is that you don't know how much, how because it's invisible to the user, how uh, actually are combined the quantum, the classical resources. However, you can with uh, D-Wave, you can now develop your own uh, custom uh, hybrid solvers where you manage the, the allocation of computational uh, classical resources and quantum uh, on your own. So this is actually a, a very good starting point to building hybrid framework, which uh, also remind are the future, because uh, in my opinion, right now, it is impossible to think about a practical application of quantum manila alone. Quantum manila must be aided with uh, classical resources, Especially in my opinion, it's very good with the hyper high performance computation framework. So this is actually a very key point for the future of the research. Other things we can work on is the data set selection because maybe this is actually more on the machine learning itself part. Especially in my opinion, this is more related to maybe we can talk about that later, to our case where we where the uh, actually a correct uh, training choice for the training sample for the data set. Uh, Kind of felt very much how we, how your how your classifier works. So actually, this is actually more of a machine learning or pure pipeline, but is also very important. Two other key aspects are the pre-processing and post-processing of the of the obtained solution. Pre-processing in the sense that uh, is done at the level of the cube program itself. For example, there are uh, literatures very paper about. Uh, uh, pre-processing of cuba problems in general that are sometimes called the pseudo boolean optimization in the literatures. For example, there is a good uh, point that is called the roof duality that is aim is to decompose a cuba problem in smaller cuba problems that are disjoint in the variables. I try to apply that to the to my problem here. The only thing is that uh, it does not work very well with fully connected problems, which is of course the problem that I'm using. So it was not much. Uh, it had not as much a point to be used here in this problem. Also, post-processing is a very good, uh, it's a very good point we, we can work on. Also using it uh, itself as quantum annealing as a post-processing unit, because uh, when we get a solution, for example, we can apply a classical post-processing, we may be using a, I don't know, a local search of the solution, or use also quantum annealing as a post-processor, because there is a new feature that is quite new that it was introduced in the D-Wave, that is called reverse annealing, 
I didn't talk about that to, today because it was out of the scope of this webinar. But basically, the main idea, without going too much in the physical implementation, is that uh, you don't use the quantum annealer as a global, let's say, optimizer, but you can somehow, starting from a candidate solution, use the annealer to perform some sort of local search. Uh, and this, in my opinion, is very, very good when considering that in a framework of classical and edge performance computation, because you can get like you know, a pipeline where you have a, a classical solver, for example, and then you can use the annealer to refine the solution. Or you can also use a annealer to get a solution and use annealer again with reverse annealing to refine a solution. This actually has a lot of potential and especially uh, I think it inserts itself very well in a high performance framework. And finally, the of course, this actually very is to provide a ad hoc framework for each problem where you what the user actually build his own framework starting from the tools which uh, use uh, classical and quantum resources. So with the very conclusion, if you want to uh, explore and uh, this uh, new word about annealing or maybe to, I don't know, to get more information about what we talked about, uh, my main suggestion would be to look at the big well resources. They are very good documentation as well as some good examples here. Now here I put two links. That is this actually, the first one is a simple, the software reference of D-Wave where you can find all the references for API as well as also some brief introduction about annealing in general. The second one is also from D-Wave where you can see how maybe that is more interesting for the people who are more up, uh, end user and you know, more interested in practical application. They were there, they can see some real application to how to apply quantum annealing to real, prob real world problems. And finally, if you want to get a very brief introduction on quantum annealing, I suggest you this book from Catherine McGill. McGill. It's a, it's a very short book, actually. And it gives you an introduction about quantum annealing, but without going too much inside the quantum physics behind, it's a very high level. So especially from people from more computer science, engineering background, that could be very helpful to start. So uh, this was uh, basically all. I'm sorry if I had to maybe go very fast from some uh, parts of my presentation, but now we have the Q&A session and we are available to, to answer. We try to answer to many doubts you might have, uh, me and Amar and everything. And thank you very much for your attention and today. Yeah, thank you very much, Eduardo, and also Amea, of course, uh, before talking about quantum computing and very nice presentations especially also with the second part, having some practical results already. Let's not forget it's ongoing research to understand all of this. We had several questions in the chat, but to the best of my knowledge, I think also Amir already answered the question Maybe from Marcel. To, to optimize the time. Yeah, because I've seen the, the yes. question popping, but I didn't pay too much attention because I was presenting. So I've seen the, some question uh, sure. in the comments. <laughs> but we have maybe time for one more question if before we close I uh, think Thorstein you have a question uh, please. could you send in the chat the links and the stuff on the last page ah okay uh, maybe uh, we can copy directly from the powerpoint and just uh, uh, yeah, yeah. paste and uh, also the first two links are about the D-Way website uh, from the you can also from the reference uh, you go to the owner website uh, explore there there are like some um, some also guides where you guide with some problems to implement uh, on on your own uh, they give you some uh, also some api reference also some uh, also how to also because it's not also important to how to in my opinion when working with these machines to how to actually uh, translate a problem into a cuba problem this actually especially yeah. i think where if you're the if you're dealing with uh, with this uh, framework must what uh, the first thing you have to do is uh, okay uh how can I efficiently uh, translate a problem into a cube problem? And the second question is, uh, is it really worth to solve a problem in, with, as a cube with an inner? So this actually I think is uh, the key point when dealing with, uh, with this, uh, with this uh, framework. Right, we will also put the um, slides yeah, of course on the RACE um, website, right? So all the material will be available. The YouTube lecture recording will take some post-processing. Um, but otherwise, I think every material will be available.
Good. So in the light of the time, I thank you again as speakers. Um, let us just maybe summarize a little bit and um, basically give you a glimpse what's coming next time. So first of all, again, thanks for joining everyone for our training today. Obviously, it was very specific, so not a complete introduction to quantum computing, but already diving into quantum support vector regression and classification algorithms. So um, in this sense, your information will be on the web page according to this event, but also future, let's say, research towards quantum computing. It's a one task in race, so there will be definitely more um, happening in the next part of the COE race project. So hence, there will be also news on the web page and more pointers to our framework with some Ocean Toolkit, let's say, example scripts and so on. Then, of course, think about our um, overall results um, that we also want to bring this in towards the use cases. So maybe we see more adoption in the future there. Who is actually also adopting quantum computing? We have seen today one of the data-driven use cases, which was remote sensing here. But of course, there might be also others that have very similar problems and can use the support vector machine problem there. So once again, um, to summarize and to, to see that there's lots of material available already, also answering a question again that was in the chat, what is the channel? Please go to the CUE Race YouTube channel there. Please subscribe to our channel to get the updates. In the moment, there are lots of videos in post-processing from our initial <laughs> trainings, but there will be soon available much more. We did basically monthly um, trainings and seminars. So also this seminar, of course, goes without saying, will be available very shortly um, on this channel. Um, basically, I would expect maybe in two to three weeks. However, uh, to give you a sneak preview of what we have the next time, we will shift the view in the next month, um, basically towards the software infrastructures to have some balance. We had no hardware infrastructures. We see IPU on graph cores. We had now basically seen D-Wave as another alternative of accelerators for quantum optimization problems. Now in software, we face a huge diversity of all these different frameworks. You probably know already here by all these different logos. And uh, one of the ideas is to think about RACE also as an interoperability of sorts for all these different frameworks that we have as part of our AI framework that you see here in its core. So the question is how we can be interoperable with many of those um, and also linking to communities which are not particularly maybe deep learning, but more st traditionally statistical computing experts with R that actually want to speed up their results on exascale resources. So here, one of the ideas is also thinking about ONNX, Open Neural Network Exchange and OpenML. They are both on different levels of interoperability, while ONNX is rather a data format and a set of, let's say, directives how to influence graphs in a more standardized fashion, or I would say de facto standard session. Um, OpenML is much more for sharing and, you know, basically thinking about what you best explain, see here, how we can basically share our data sets tasks and flows, it goes way beyond just this normal standard that we have here in the ONNX, but rather think about the whole pipeline, how we can share these data sets together with the underlying scripts that you need for computations in order to run them. So this would be also interesting, not only for race to get perhaps new users, because we want to have our supercomputers and our exascale AI, of course, also um, provided to new users, which are maybe previously have been always been in the, let's say, workstation domain using just one GPU or have been using even serial computing with just CPUs in, Pyth uh, in Python or so. Um, of course, for us, it's also enabling um, probably a wide more spread use. So basically, you would look into the next month how actually RACE takes advantage of ONNX and OpenML as part of the unique framework. So more to come, join us in May. The date and time will be soon announced. And with this, I would say thanks for everyone um, staying here and talk to you next time.